Okay, okay that's fine. Uh, hi, everybody. I This is really kind of special for me because I don't usually get to talk to such a diverse group of people. Of I see current students, I see former students, I see colleagues, I see all sorts of people that I've never seen before. And one of the things, if you don't know me, I really like for you to ask me questions and I will answer anybody's question. And you can ask me anything about anything as I'm going along. I'm gonna start talking about a bunch of things and I'm gonna start probably talking way too fast because I get very excited when I'm talking about vision. Uh, so the only way to really slow me down is probably to ask questions. So I, I, please do ask questions uh, anytime. My talk, um, I gave this title just to kind of make you think of kind of what's going on here. Kale Origami and Phil Mickelson. Um, this was the picture that I saw they put up on the website. And I was thinking about this same kind of question here from a very different kind of perspective. So I'm gonna be talking about kale with a special kind of substance that's in there, a special carotenoid that's in there that's called zeaxanthin. And I'm going to talk about zeaxanthin and what zeaxanthin does for the eye. I'm going to talk about a special kind of microscope that you can make out of origami. And I've been working with some people at Stanford and some other places where you can actually make a microscope with a folded piece of paper and a little glass bead. And I'm going to show you some pictures that we have from my, my lab of uh, being able to look and kind of use this microscope. And I'm also going to give everybody one of those microscopes at the very end too. So you can have one of those too. So, and there, there's instructions how to make it. And yes, and we can talk about all that. So yeah, so I'm going to give you one of, every, everybody is going to get one of those. So I'm just, I'm just giving you the, the, the heads up for that. So that's something to get excited about. That's, that's, that's so you pay attention the whole time. If you get up and leave, you don't get a fold scope. Uh, so you have to pay attention the whole time to get a fold scope. You have and, to like answer questions at that you, I think you have to ask questions. You don't have to answer questions. You should ask questions if you want to get a full scope. Uh, and then the last thing I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about a new kind of golf ball that I was working on. It's actually not a, the ball itself. I was working on something vision related with this ball. Uh, and I'm going to tell the story kind of of what we did with that, ex some experiments with that. And now it's actually being used on the tour by Phil Mickelson. So you can kind of kind of guess maybe, maybe what, what those three things have in common, but, but maybe not yet because I'm going to talk about some other things with that too. So that's, that's kind of the overall thing of, of what's going to happen. I'm going to talk about this special pigment that's in the eye that's called zeaxanthin. I'm going to talk about what goes on with a fold scope and be able to use this fold scope for different kinds of applications for the eye. And I'm going to talk about this special golf ball design that we have that we can s see in kind of how it's actually working. It's actually, you can buy that golf ball anywhere now. It's in Golf Galaxy, it's in Target, it's in Dick's. Uh, it's, it's everywhere. I do want to give my disclaimer that I was funded from Zia Vision. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of that work that was funded from Zia Vision. Uh, I don't get any benefits from Callaway, uh, but UMSL has been receiving some in-kind donations from Callaway because of this project uh, we've been working on. I also just wanted to start off because I know there's not anybody that's not talked about an uh, optometry uh, for the Academy of Science. I just want to just, just mention what optometrists do. Optometrists, they die diagnose, manage, and treat conditions uh, and diseases of the human eye and visual system. And one of the things I'm going to kind of start to do is sort of look at what happens in terms of thinking about what optometry does and maybe how research can kind of fit into that and kind of the important things that we can learn from doing research and in terms of how it's going to be applied to the eye. One of the first things that an optometrist is going to do is look at eyelashes. I'm, I'm, I'm saying this now because this is going to show up later. 
We're, we're actually going to do something. I'm going to talk about something in eyelashes later that's going to be kind of an important thing. In fact, it's going to be using that fold scope. So that's kind of just something to look for later. Uh, I'm sorry, what? It does catch debris, but there's going to be some other things that we'll see maybe in there too. Uh, what's that? So, 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 so eyelashes is going to be one thing that we're going to be thinking about, and then kind of thinking about looking inside the eye. Again, I, many of you probably have never seen the inside of an eye before. When an optometrist looks inside your eye, they see a picture of this back of the eye. What's really interesting about it is this is actually part of your brain. This is one place where you can actually visualize, you can actually see part of someone's brain just looking outside the body. You don't need to open up the skull and look in. The eye, the retina is actually part of the brain. It grows out from the brain. So you can get an idea of, at least in part, not only what's going on with the eye, but some of these things you can actually learn about what's going on about other areas like the brain or other areas of the body because you can see blood vessels that's there too. If there's a problem in blood vessels, other places in the body, you can look right in and see those blood vessels on the back of the eye. So the eye, this, this, this view that you can get in is a very special kind of thing that we can do. And one of the things I'm just going to try to, it's hard to see, and you're going to have to kind of take my word for this, but there's an area of this eye that's called the macula. That's, that's one of the things we do when we look in the eye. You can look at this macula, and this macula is a part of the eye that's most sensitive. It allows us to see details. And sometimes people get disease. You may have heard of macular degeneration. What happens in macular degeneration, this area of the retina, degenerates and this person doesn't have very good visual acuity anymore. And one of the things it may be related to, it's not the only thing, but one of the things that's certainly associated with that is going to be that, that I'm going to be talking about macular pigment and this association with macular pigment and macular degeneration too. So I'm kind of giving you this kind of just sort of thinking about what an optometrist does and then kind of thinking about how we can start looking at different places as we're kind of looking our way through this, this pathway that's there. Everybody's with me. Everybody's okay. Okay? And again, just w now as we start to get better and better techniques, you know, we can do things like OCT and actually start to image what's going on in cellular layers looking into the back of the eye. So now we can start getting lots and lots of information in terms of what's happening. Uh, and if there may be diseases, if there may be degeneration, if there may be other kind of problems that are going on. So all that's kind of an exciting kind of thing to be able to visualize and see these kind of processes. So again, I'm going to say, what, why is it important for research? We can learn about how normal eyes work. We can help diagnose diseases earlier and better. We can follow how diseases are either getting better or not getting better if we come up with new and better ways to do this. And one of the things that I'm also interested in is sort of real world kinds of applications, not just disease in eyes, which is really, really important, but sometimes people ask questions, real world kinds of questions, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. It's going to be the golf ball part uh, that kind of comes up with that. We have a website, and again, I think this will all get posted later. My, that's what my understanding is. This will all be on YouTube later. Uh, Can you pick up one of these bookmarks to use to that site, as well as our, all of our path but you, you, you can get links, and, and one of the nice things about our website is there's links about kind of new things that are going on in vision, things that are going on in the school, and it's actually kind of this updated often in terms of links that, that keep changing, new clinical cases, new research kinds of things are going on. So those are all things that are important. And the other thing is, I'm going to give you my email a couple of different times here, but Bassi and Umsol, that's all you need to do, Bassi and Umsol, and you can always email me. I, I will try, I'm, I try very hard to answer questions as quickly as I can, but uh, sometimes it may be a little bit of a, of a lag, but uh, please email me anytime. So what, what 
I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting to what I'm going to start talking about. I'm kind of almost to that point now. And I just kind of want to just say about just sort of my background a little bit. I have been studying structure and function in the eye for a long, long time. I'm interested of how things in the eye, what kind of the, the physical structure that's there, the cells are there, how it impacts what goes on in terms of function. And I've looked at this anatomically. I've looked at just putting electrodes in the eye or on the eye and be able to make measurements, electrical potential um, measurements, and then lots of other just kinds of visual tests. So I'm going to talk about some of those kinds of things. I actually started out studying goldfish. Goldfish have a remarkable visual system, and maybe some other time I can tell that story. But they actually add cells in their eye throughout their whole life. A little baby goldfish and a big goldfish has a whole different numbers and ratios of different cell types that are there. And it's kind of an interesting thing. It's one of the few vertebrates that adds neurons throughout its whole life. So it's really kind of an interesting kind of system. And they have the exact same kind of visual sensitivity as humans do under similar kinds of conditions. So they have three cones. They have rods like we do. If you do the same kind of visual test for a goldfish, you can see a human gets exactly the same kind of responses, depending on the test. But there's, there's certainly some tests that are like that. So it was, it was an interesting kind of model system for working with that. I, I worked a lot in, in the past with patients with Alzheimer's disease. And again, this is kind of another interesting thing. There's a lot of things that happen in the visual system of patients with Alzheimer's disease. They actually end up degenerating optic nerve axons. Uh, and it's one of the things that happens that, that you know, it's not always talked about with Alzheimer's. Everybody talks about things going on in the brain. There's things going on in the eye, too. And that has an impact of vision. That has an impact of what they're able to see, how they're able to respond, how they're even able to navigate their environment. And I worked with patients and kind of looking at those structural kinds of things and what happens in terms of vision that's going to result from that. I have a new test that, that, that can measure suppression, and I'm going to talk about these last three things in detail about macular pigment, the fold scope, and golf ball psychophysics. I've got lots of, this, this isn't everybody, but I've got lots of collaborators, and I've been really so lucky to be able to work with so many great people from all sorts of different places, and uh, I'm going to talk about s many of these people and kind of, this is just sort of some names to kind of throw out uh, and, and faces to kind of link up with, with things later on. I, I did want to just mention two people in particular, uh, Michael Howe and Wayne Garver, those are two colleagues colleagues of mine that we've really a lot of the things that, that I'm going to talk about in terms of building things or making things they've been intimately involved with all of that because Michael's a machinist and Wayne is an electronics person and talk about talk about me being the luckiest person in the world I can say here I, I want to make one of these things and those two can kind of get together and help me to make these things that I'm going to talk about for for some of these devices so it's, if you get a good team with you, that's kind of one of the best things that can happen in life uh, is, is to kind of surround yourself with these kind of good people like this. So I, I'm going to start talking about macular pigment. And my, my story with macular pigment came about from I got a phone call. I got a phone call from Dennis Gerhardt. And he said, I'm here, at, I work at Zia Vision. This is a relatively new company. Zia Vision is a company here in St. Louis. Uh, I, I, I have some anecdotal evidence. I have some stories of people tell me if they take this macular pigment, zeaxanthin, they say that they have less glare sensitivity. And I want to know, is that really happening or not? But one of the things that's really nice about uh, Dr. Gerhardt is that he tries very hard to follow the science of things and not just kind of take people's word necessarily. I mean, that's, that's an important thing, but to actually look at this, to actually study this and see if it's kind of a problem that's, that can actually be done or not be done. So I'm going to talk a little bit about just a couple of the studies that we were involved with. And now this, this field of macular pigments kind of really explode and there's kind of lots of interesting things that have kind of come from all of that. So macular pigment is, is it's an old story. I mean the first time it was described was in the 1700s. 
Somebody looked in someone's eye and said, oh, that looks like a yellow spot in there. That yellow spot, that area that I showed you before, that macula, depending on the kind of the light that you're looking at things and kind of what's going on, it looks, it can have this little bit of a different kind of appearance that's there. This little bit of a yellow appearance that's there. And that's the, this, the, the uh, Buzzy had, had named this the yellow spot of the eye. And the other, about the same time, Summerling had also described this, he called it this, this limbo luteo, that's kind of an orangish yellow kind of color that's there, but this is, it was the same idea. You look in the back of the eye and it looks like in the back of the eye there's kind of this little color difference that's there. And it turns out that little color difference is a really important thing that's going to be happening. One of the things we know about zeaxanthin is it's one of the class of chemicals is called a carotenoid. And if you look out in the world, there are at least 600 different carotenoids that you can find in nature. And if you look and start kind of looking at these carotenoids and kind of see what's going on, you see that about 50 of those carotenoids you see out in nature, they're in the food chain. And of those 50, you see 13 kind of at least at some level in the, in the human plasma and six at least there's a fairly substantial amount in the human plasma. But in the eye, there's only three. So that tells us there's kind of all of these carotenoids that are out there and yet they all, just not all these kind of start out in the world and only a few of them end up in the eye. And not only do they end up in the eye, they end up in that one spot I was talking about right near the macula, right in that very center part of vision that has that yellow spot looking thing that's there. Well, it, it, a carotenoid is, it, 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 it's based on the chemical compound that's there. So it's, 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 it's actually based on beta carotene is, is part of it is, is what's there. Okay, is everybody okay with this? Just sort of this idea of you've got lots out in the world, you end up with only a few in the eye. This must be doing something important. This must be doing something in the eye that has some kind of, of, of importance that's there. And the three that are there are is zeaxanthin, mesozeaxanthin, lutein. I'm going to mainly talk about zeaxanthin and lutein. Those are the ones that are kind of found in the, in the greatest abundance right in that very center part of the eye that's there. Again, this is going to, now, now we're getting to the kale part uh, that's here. <laughs> Finally, we're at kale. And if you look and kind of just where some of these different kind of compounds are found naturally, one of the places is kale. Look at kale compared to all these other kinds of good things that's there. There's a whole lot of these both lutein and zeaxanthin mix in kale. So this is something that you know people say eat kale, it's good for you. Well, one of the things that we know is it certainly provides some of these, these necessary carotenoids. These carotenoids are found in that, that central area of the eye. Kale's not the only one. I mean, there, there's spinach and greens and uh, corn is actually another one. And again, some of these kind of make sense. Corn, certainly from that yellow color, something that's going to be there. One of the things that's not on here that's not a vegetable is eggs. The yolks of eggs has lots and lots of uh, zeaxanthin and lutein. That's probably because it's concentrated from the corn, that the, especially if they're corn-fed uh, chickens. They end up having a lot of this, this, this zeaxanthin and, and lutein that's there. So one of the places you can get zeaxanthin and lutein is just naturally in the diet, and especially if you eat things that are delicious like kale. Uh, I, I like kale, actually. Uh, kelp? Well, I like kelp too. I actually, don't, I actually, that's a good question because I don't know what, I don't know how much zeaxanthin and lutein is in kelp. I don't know that. Yeah. It would be interesting. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, yeah. I, I just, I'm just going to say this. I'm, I know some of these are just kind of numbers, and I don't want to really talk about numbers as much as kind of overall what's going on, but one of the things we know about these compounds, about lutein and zeaxanthin, if you look at the light that they absorb, 
So if you just pass a whole lot of light, different wavelengths of light through lutein and zeaxanthin, what you see is it selectively absorbs blue light. If you look at this peak of where the absorption is, it's absorbing blue light right around 460 nanometers. It's actually really hard to discriminate between lutein and zeaxanthin just based on their absorption properties. If you do kind of just do experiments, it's really hard to do. It's not so bad if they're actually kind of isolated, but it's, it's a hard kind of thing just to kind of measure that directly. And that's why it's consistent reflecting yellow absorption. And that's why that reflecting yellow is what's going to be happening. Be because what's, what's happening is what you're doing is you're taking out the blue light and you're letting red and green light pass through. Red and green light together gives you yellow. Uh, so that's why it looks yellow when you're looking through it. The other thing... Are you, are you, oh, oh. Okay, I thought it was a question. Uh, the other thing that's kind of interesting about this, it really has a practical kind of implication is, uh, I'm gonna do this picture next, is if you look at white LEDs, and a lot of people now, if they, they complain about cars. They say cars, when they're coming at me, these new cars with the new lights, those lights look really bright. If you look at the light output from a white LED, it's not uniform white. It doesn't have uniform wavelengths. It has this big peak in blue and another peak in this sort of yellow green area. And you put those together and it's going to appear to be white. So you're mixing this yellow with this, this yellow green light and you mix those together and it's going to appear to be white. But there's a lot, lot, lot of blue light that's in there. And it turns out this is one of the other interesting things is that we are much more sensitive to glare, to lights. They seem brighter if they have a lot of short wavelengths in them. So this is why people complain about the LED lights is they, they have this big blue spike that's there. And they're especially going to be complaining about this if they don't have a blue pigment in their eye. If you have a lot of blue pigment in your eye that might be absorbing, remember where, where, remember where it's absorbing? It was absorbing almost this exact same spot. That's where zeaxanthin and lutein are absorbing. It's in the same place, 450 to 460 nanometers. So if you don't have much zeaxanthin and lutein, it's going to be maybe something that's associated with glare. So when, Dennis, when, when Dr. Gerhardt called me, he said, well, people anecdotally, they're taking zeaxanthin, they're complaining less of glare. Maybe what's happening is we're getting less of this blue light that's going to be there and they're going to have fewer complaints. So we tested this. We tested this directly is what we did, is, is what the idea was. Is everybody with me with the idea? So for natural sunlight, the curve would be flat? For, for, for natural sunlight, if you kind of look under normal conditions, it's pretty flat. It's not exactly flat, but it's pretty flat. But it definitely has a lot of, of, of blue that's in there too, in sunlight. A lot of other lights, like incandescent lights and some of the older kinds of headlights, they had very, very little blue light. Most of that fact is why they kind of look yellow reddish is because they have a lot kind of higher peak with not much of the blue that's there. Does the modulation from the LED exacerbate that blue? Because you know they're not on or off, they're being pulsed. That, that, that pulse is such a high flicker rate, it's not going to have any impact. To, yeah. But it, it, that, you're, you're absolutely right. That's how they're working. They're, they're, not, they're not on off. They, they have a, it's, it's a very high temporary. Pushing it even more toward the blue, it, or the dye isn't picking it, or at least the brain's not picking it, it, it up. Even, even the retina can't pick it up at, at that kind of level. The, our retina can pick up some of the other, like our fluorescent lights, they can actually pick up some of that, even though it looks steady. The retina, you can yeah. do recordings, yeah. But not, not even, they can't even do it with the LEDs, because they, they're usually, the temporal rate, how fast they're going, is usually more than 100 times a second. So that's way above kind of what we're able to perceive. Um, does it matter what eye color you have? That's a, that's a really good question. What, she asked, what, what about eye color? Does that have any impact? And the answer is it kind of does. 
that we know people generally that have lighter color eyes tend to have less pigment in their eyes. So it's including the macular pigment too. So that's certainly something that can happen. So that's a good question. What about the blue light in computers? And, and again, you know, that's one of the things there's kind of a lot of interest in now. If you look at blue light in computers and cell phones, the light output's not a lot, it's not real high intensity, but there is more blue light around now than there used to be. And that's, that's, I'm kind of dancing around of saying that, yeah, there is more blue light and that certainly has an impact, but there's not, it's not really bright intensity. And that's, these are the kinds of things, it's, so you don't have, usually have glare kind of thing from the sources like that as much. Although some people still complain with computer screens of glare, and that, that, could, that can be something that happens with some people. Um, the, the, the other thing though with that, what we can have with blue light, and there certainly is lots of evidence for that is, you don't even need to have high intensity. It actually can affect circadian rhythms, our body's rhythm in terms of timing of things. And the blue light actually has direct input into the circadian system and relatively low levels of light can have an impact of that. So people that use tablets and other things at night, there can be issues sometimes. Uh, so it's always good to, have your settings that are nighttime settings. What happens with the nighttime setting, not only does it make it dimmer, it actually puts less blue light out too uh, when you use that nighttime setting. So basically less blue light is less glare? But basically less blue light is, is less glare. Yeah, that's perfect, perfect way to put it. Yep, yep. Okay, everybody's good. So we made a device. You can see whose head that is looking in the device. You can tell, even though my face is there, there's other identifiable features uh, that, that may say who that is looking in there. Uh, but th this was a device we made and we called it the light sensitivity meter. It's nothing more than a series of these white LED lights. We, we wanted to use those white LED lights to measure glare and had a whole bunch of these white LED lights. And basically you can turn these on and see kind of how much light you need before someone says, yeah, that, that, that's causing me some kind of, I see that glare response that's there. So what we did was we, did, we, we, we measured macular pigment, we, we supplemented people with macular pigment. So they ended up, the, 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 we, we started off with a group that had relatively low macular pigment and had a lot of glare problems is, is what, what, what ended up happening. It turned out those that had low macular pigment did have more glare issues. And what we did is we supplemented them and we saw this increase in macular pigment that happened. And what we did was is we looked at this light sensitivity measurement and we saw that there was a significant change. It took a long time. It took six months to happen. And it that's actually goes along with what goes on with this accumulation of pigment in the eye. It doesn't, you don't take, kale in and it's immediately all this kind of gets deposited in or you don't take a supplement it kind of it's there it takes a while to build up and it, it's that's kind of consistent with that in terms of this this accumulation of pigment that's happening everybody's with me everybody's with me you're all with me back there too yes, sir. okay i'm just making sure So I want to talk about one other study that, that I did, uh, actually, actually I did along with a graduate student of mine, uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Chris Putnam. He, he came with, uh, worked in my lab for a few years as part of an Air Force program. And the Air Force was kind of interested in some of these kinds of things that were going on. And he, he worked in my lab and we developed a couple of devices and some ways of testing for glare. And kind of wanted to do it on a kind of a more precise level. Not just kind of just blasting the light, eye, light everywhere in the eye. We, we were kind of trying to be careful and try to pick exactly where we were trying to do measurements. So rather than kind of just this general kind of stimulus, we had very specific points that we were trying to test. Because one of the things we know is that macular pigment isn't everywhere in the eye. 
it's only right in that very central portion of the eye. So we wanted to map out the central portion, see exactly how much pigment there was in different places, and then test in those specific areas to see if we could directly correlate now this macular pigment levels and glare sensitivity. And I don't want to go into a lot of details of this, but it's we were able to do these kinds of tests. We tested at all these different positions, had a person fixate on a spot, and then we could test in all these different areas. And we, we ended up kind of coming up with lots of ways of measuring things. We could measure this difference in terms of as you move away from the central part of the fovea, there's less and less of this macular pigment. These are all individual subjects. This is a lot of variability. And this is actually one of the things we know is there's a lot of variability from person to person how much of this macular pigment there is. Some people had very, very little macular pigment, in this, even in the center, and those people will usually complain more of glare problems. People that had more macular pigment tend to complain less about things that were going on. And again, I'm just, I, I don't want to bore you with the numbers, but it, you'll have to take my word on this. But we, we, we were actually able to show within these specific regions, we came up with metrics, kind of ways to look at this. And where there was more macular pigment, there was less glare sensitivity. So it was this direct correlation now in terms of glare. Just how, you need to say that again, because you said it perfectly. I forgot. <laughs> it, it was oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. like less blue light, less, blue. less blue light, less glare, and now we're going to have less blue light getting there because there's more macular pigment. The macular pigment is going to mean there's less blue light getting there, so there's going to be less glare that's there. Wait, so just to confirm this, uh, sunlight is easier to get, like, used to than artificial light because sunlight has less glare? Um, sunlight has a lot wider distribution of wavelengths, so it's that's one... It's not It's not, it doesn't have that just kind of this spike in one place yeah. that's there. It's kind of more of an even distribution. Oh, so that's kind of, that's one of the things that's kind of a, the good thing about the sunlight as a source. Okay? Everybody's good. It, it absolutely does. It absolutely does. And that's part of what, that's part of the process that's going on with that. I just want to, I'm only going to say this, and there's this whole emerging field. It's actually blown up in the last three years. It not only is macular pigment important in the eye, but there's zeaxanthin and lutein that's found in the brain. And this just so I said the eye is part of the brain, same kind of thing that's going on here is the zeaxanthin and lutein also found in the brain. It's not just absorbing blue light, it's actually doing other kinds of things too. The other kinds of things are it actually improves conduction speed and it actually gets rid of free radicals. That's a good thing for the retina, getting rid of free radicals in terms of maybe protecting the eye for macular degeneration. It's good in the brain of this free radical protection because, again, it may be something that's helping in terms of damage It may be there. There's, if you look up... You ask really good questions, and, and the question was: Is if 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 someone's younger, do they have how much macular pigment does does they have compared to someone who's older? And the answer is, it looks a little bit like it, there's not quite as much macular pigment in, in kids who are really young. And I'm saying really young, you know, less than five and six years old. There's often a little bit less macular pigment, and then as you get older, older is above 80. There tends to be less macular pigment on average, even independent of whether it's disease or not. And then if you start kind of looking at mid-range, there's kind of this, this increase and then a gentle fall off that happens. So it's, it, it's, it, it's not just young lots and old not lots. It's kind of more like a kind of a gentle kind of curve that's there. Does that make sense? Okay. 
Okay. That was actually the, the, the very first slide I showed about macular pigment, that somering. He actually described that. He, he said that the, that yellow spot looks not as yellow for really young kids and older adults, but in the middle range, they, they looked more darker yellow that's there. So it's the same thing, same kind of, exact same kind of thing that's there. But oh, I was just going to say, if there, there's now this evidence for zeaxanthin. I, I'm not trying to sell snake oil, and I'm not trying to say it, it fixes everything because it doesn't. That, that's not going to be the case. Diet, good diet is a good thing, and certainly some of these things are probably going to be useful kinds of things that can happen. So again, better memory scores, there's been these macular pigment levels, and, and all, again, all these are kind of good journals of things in terms of all these studies. This, this is the only study, there's been a number of studies like this that are now coming out about improved memory, improved speed of processing and reaction times, better brain connectivity, all these things are associated with these, these carotenoids that's there. And even now it's being used, almost every Major League Baseball team is now using some paprika, they're calling it a paprika uh, extract. It's, it's actually, what it is, is it's zeaxanthin is, is what they're using. Uh, and all the Major League Baseball teams actually are giving the player supplements. Again, it's gonna be kind of one of these processes where it looks like it helps in terms of reaction time, it helps in terms of speed of processing uh, and things that are going on. Okay? So that's kale. Let's talk about origami. Yes! I love origami. <laughs> that's why you're here. So I saw a TED talk a few years ago, and it was M Manu Prakash at Stanford. And Manu gave a talk on, he called it the fold scope. He, he, actually what he called at the time was the 50 cent microscope. Uh, and he gave a TED talk, he, he's an engineer at Stanford, and what he's done and has continued to do is try to develop instruments that can be used by the masses for and, and cheaply produced that can be used for taking the place of traditional kinds of laboratory equipment. So he's got a centrifuge just made out of one of those toy tops that you can kind of spin. He had this microscope that he described where it's a piece of car, he starts off with a piece of cardboard folds the piece of cardboard so it's kind of a flat surface. And in fact, I have kind of one that's, this isn't exactly it, but it's kind of, this is sort of the newer model. This is the microscope, it's how big it ends up. This is actually bigger than it used to be. My, the old one was a little bit smaller. I could actually fit in my pocket. Uh, so I think this is too big and bulky. Uh, no, no, I think this, it's kind of amazing. So this, this is the microscope uh, that, that's made by just folding together paper. The only other thing this has is a little tiny glass bead. And that little tiny glass bead is acting as a magnifier. It's a little tiny magnifying glass that's there. And this little tiny magnifying glass is put into the middle of this origami folded paper and you can start to see really spectacular kinds of microscopic images through this kind of device. You can see by, when you take these home, when you can put these together and you can hold them up to light and see things. There are attachments that you can get to put it onto a cell phone. And if you put it onto a cell phone, you can take these pictures and they look gorgeous. And I'll show you some of these kinds of pictures that you can take with it. But when I saw this talk, I was so excited that I, I, I saw the talk. And when the talk was over, five minutes later, I emailed him and I said, um, Dr. Prakash, you don't know me. I work in the Midwest and I'm interested in vision and I think you've got a fantastic idea. And what I want to do is I want to try to look at, at things going on in the visual system with this. I think you could make this into a diagnostic device that we could use for assessing things in and around the eye. Without dragging instruments 
without dragging instruments around. And also, maybe this could be something, you don't even have to worry about something being sterile. You can use it once and get rid of it if you have to. Uh, but it's, it's a, a way, that, or what I was thinking about is maybe taking this out into places that really have very limited access to instruments that's there. So this, this would be a device that we could kind of use for doing some kinds of clinical diagnoses. So I did this five minutes after I saw the talk. Ten minutes after that, he says, we're collaborating. I've been waiting for you to call for the last three years. I wanted a clinician to call. And I'm not a clinician, but he wanted somebody to be working on clinical ideas. And he said, I've been waiting for your call. I mean, he was joking, but he said, I've been waiting for you to call because I, I want people to be working on this. And so 15 minutes after I was done with the TED Talk, we're working on a project together. It's, it's, it's the, the internet, the world's an amazing place that you can kind of do these kinds of things. So my work started with just seeing this on the internet and I sent an email to him saying, I want to do something with you. So here's a picture that I took. And this kind of looks a little bit like maybe what, that one of those early pictures I was showing you. This is a retina from a human eye. And this is the part that's the fovea right in the middle of the macula that's there. You can see all these nice cells and you can kind of get a very nice picture of what's going on through this 50 cent microscope. This 50 cent microscope you could throw on the ground and step on it and pick it up and still see images through it. What's the shape of the glass bead? It's, it literally is a commercially available glass bead. It's used for glass bead blowing, uh, beading. So it's, it's, it's not a special bead. It's, it's, it's an abrasive bead, is what it started out as. Uh, okay, so that's why you, that's why it's it, that that's that's why it's so hardy. It's it's a, it, 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 it was there all along. It's all it's always it's, it's it's been there. It was there all along, and it took him to kind of figure this out and kind of do this kind of thing. I was interested in maybe trying to do this with impression cytology. Impression cytology is you can look at cells in the conjunctiva and it's actually kind of easy to get cells off the conjunctiva. You can even just get scotch tape and lay that down and rip off a few cells. Uh, it's not good. I don't really want to do it like that, but, uh, but it, it's, it's an easy kind of process to get some of these cells. And what happens in vitamin A deficiency, there is some evidence that these cells end up having misshapen uh, nuclei that's there. And one of the things that I thought might be a valuable thing for this device is, again, in places where there's nutrition problems, you could take this out and have a very quick kind of diagnosis for a vitamin A deficiency. And we kind of did some pilot work and kind of showed that you really can get very quick, easy images doing that. And I also was interested, I talked about eyelashes. Remember I talked about the eyelash and said, remember the eyelash, because we're going to come back to that. Uh, one of the things that happens with eyelashes and other areas of the face is sometimes there's a little critters that get on there. They're called demodex. And people may have heard of these demodex, but they're, they, they're these little mites. Almost impossible to kind of see these mites, but they're there all the time. Many, many people have these mites on their face in other places, especially in the eyelashes. And especially as you get older, it's more likely to have these mites that are there. So what I did was pluck out an eyelash of a person. This is the eyelash. That's the mite that's there. And I'll, I'll, I'll let you know this is actually a living mite because watch. Oops, oops. So that's that's it. That's it. Do you see? Did you see that? Did you catch that? Did we, I, yeah. let, let's do that again. Oh, oh they're, they're still going. It's, the eye so this, this is the base of the eyelash, and that's what these, these mites feed on. They feed on lipids and other kinds of things that are, that are in the eyelash uh, follicle that's there. Are they in the papilla? They are. They are? Yeah. Can you try to kill them? 
you can, and there's actually, there's, they're actually pretty easy to treat. There's tree, tree, tea tree oil is one of the things that kind of really helps a lot with, uh, with, with getting rid of them. Uh, but they're, they're kind of there. And some people, when you pull these lashes out, I didn't bring those pictures because it, it usually makes everybody really shudder when you see about, about, about 10 of them kind of crawling on each individual eyelash that's there. This is something that's associated with dry eye. Uh, and it's one of the things that can happen with people. It's not, it's not the only cause of dry eye by any stretch, but it's, it's one of the causes of, uh, that can happen with dry eyes having these demodex uh, infestations. Would you feel that? You don't feel it. They're, they're there. You don't have to get rid of them because a lot of times people people can have it not known. That if, if it doesn't, if there's only a few of them around, it's kind of like we always have things around. There's we don't think about that, but there's are kind of we're we're a host for lots of things. When you start seeing this, every, everybody goes home and starts washing their eyelashes with baby soap and do all kinds of things. And I know that's all everybody's going to do that, but this this is how it's they've always been there. They've always, they're always kind of around. Wait, so like what they do when they damage or something? I, I, if there's a lot of them, what they do is they like eat... How much? Like, like a lot of them? I'm not, I don't... Like, they, they, it, like you, you probably, you probably always, I bet almost everybody in here has maybe a Demodex. Maybe? Maybe 4,000. We'll say 4,000. That, that'll be a number we can... Uh, that's a number. Uh, <laughs> But if there's a lot of milk, they'll, they'll, if they're eating up all the lipid, then there's not going to be things to help keep that eye lubricated that's there. Will your eye doctor tell you if you have it? They will, and they, they can see those. Uh, if, if they, a lot of times it's done with other kind of microscopes. If you don't have access to a microscope, you're not going to be able to see that. This, that's, dry eye pharmaceuticals also treat those, or are they strictly working on them? They don't. They don't. That's working on other kind of mechanisms, typically. Okay. So this is this is one of these uh, again. This is you know trying to apply these kinds of things into real world kinds of applications is kind of a thing that's of interest. And not only just this kind of thing. I, I really am interested in trying. And I've worked with people in our College of Education. We're starting to try to do things for citizen science kinds of applications of trying to get kids in schools using these microscopes. And there's going to be a graduate student in the College of Ed who's going to be working on a project that we're going to be taking these fold scopes into schools in uh, St. Louis uh, and, and working and trying to use this in, in for different kinds of applications. Again, there, the, if you go to the full scope website, you'll see lots and lots of things in terms of things of, of ways this has been done. When you get your fold scope, there's going to be a number, and you should register your fold scope. And when you register your number for the fold scope, you get access to these pictures that are taken all over the world. Uh, and it's really, I mean, that's really one of the fun things too, is you kind of get access and you kind of see things are happening everywhere. It's just an amazing kind of process that's going on. And I think that, that's almost as exciting as kind of doing it on your own is to see other people do this in kind of ways they're using it. It gives you ideas of things to do. It makes you help kind of connect to the big world and kind of have these kinds of, of things that are happening. Okay. So, oh, I was just going to mention one other thing. I am I'm going to be working with uh, Quadwo Kufo in Ghana. He's an optometrist. Uh, it's actually kind of interesting. He actually worked for Ma with Macular Pigment for a long time. That's how I met him. Uh, but he's actually going to be doing some projects in Ghana with a fold scope too and trying to do some of these kinds of applications in places where there's not a lot of access to other kinds of, of equipment. Can I give you, uh, you can, uh, here, take, yes, 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 yes. What color do you want? What color? Blue. There's a blue. Red. Red. Actually gray. Gray. Thank you. You're welcome. Everybody okay? Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm getting, I, 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 everybody's good. So I'm just going to talk about the last project. This started with a phone call. 
Ray Barrett, who was a, the CEO at Biomedical Systems, uh, it, it's a international corporation that worked a lot first with heart monitors and then later with other kinds of medical and statistical kinds of applications. He gave me a call and Mr. Barrett said, I have an idea for a golf ball and I heard you're the person to talk to if I want to test this. And I, I, I was thinking, I don't know why, I, I don't golf. Uh, and I wasn't sure why necessarily he was calling me, but I said, sure, I'll talk to you. And that kind of started this journey that ended up now with uh, it, it being used in the PGA. In fact, it was just used today. Uh, two different golfers are, are using it today. Uh, it, 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 uh, the, the Byron Nelson. Uh, what, Phil Mickelson and uh, uh, Kelly Kraft uh, are the two that are, they're using. So, uh, but he, he said, I have an idea. My idea is I have a hard time. When I first did this, I, I had a hard time. I, I go out and golf with my buddies and I hit the ball and I'm getting older and I can't see where the ball went. And he said, my wife told me to put some lines on a golf ball. And I, I put a red, green, and blue line on the golf ball. And I hit the ball, and I still couldn't see where it went. But he said, well, what's happening was it seemed like I was putting better. Uh, and a lot of times things happen in science. A lot of times things happen that you don't necessarily expect one direction, but they kind of go these directions. And you kind of end up doing something very different than when you first started out doing. And he said, my, my putting got better. And I, I actually was now no longer the worst guy in the group. I was actually getting to be kind of up in the group a little bit and everybody else was buying me lunch and I thought this is really great. Uh, but I really want to test this to see if this is something that's, that's real. If this is really something that's something that's, that's, that's worth doing or not. So he, he said he wanted to know if you put stripes on a golf ball does it make you a better putter. And I'm not saying you're going to putt like Tiger. And he wasn't trying to say that either, but he just wanted to know is there any kind of improvement that you're going to see by putting stripes on a golf ball. And again, just kind of, just kind of thinking about things. A lot of times, these these multiple stripes or multiple lines are something that are used in lots of kinds of applications when you're trying to aim, when you're trying to position things. These parallel lines are something that's often used as a way to get better alignment. That's kind of how our, our eyes are kind of geared to see is kind of making sure things are parallel and kind of being able to align things in different places. So I'm going to talk just quickly, and I, I want to run through this. some of this. Is, I, I can talk about vernier acuity. This is actually kind of a, the principle of how this is based on. I, I just, I'll just show you this one number that if we look at normal kind of vision, we have a sensitivity. It's called one arc minute. So we can kind of make this discrimination as long as these, these points are at least one arc minute apart in the visual system. So there's got to be enough separation that's there. And that arc minute, it'll depend on how far away it is, but it'll be that, that constant, that one arc minute approximately is kind of what our sensitivity is for a normal visual acuity kind of task. But if you do an alignment kind of task, it ends up being much, much better. It's three arc seconds. So it's a much greater improvement in terms of your accuracy if you don't you kind of use standard kinds of ways of, of just measuring sort of displacements or things are there, but to actually be able to come up with this vernier kind of task to be able to align things better. And that's the idea behind these idea of these, these lines and we're we're really good at picking up these lines, whether they're parallel or not, in terms of seeing things. It doesn't take much of a displacement that's there, and especially if you're trying to align these other targets too, it all helps in terms of that being able to do this alignment by having these multiple stripes that's there. And again, it's, it's critical that the stripes are parallel. And not only parallel, it turns out there's other factors that kind of help improve things. You can't have the lines 
too, too close, that actually makes it worse a little bit. So you have to have enough separation that's there. And the one other thing that seems like it helps is, is if you have contrasting colors in the flanks on the outside part than you do in the center part. We know this from vision research. This wasn't from golf ball studies. This is just from vision research trying to look at these kinds of factors. So the idea was we, we, we put the lines on the golf ball, not just this red, green, and blue line. Now we put contrasting flanks that were kind of this right separation. Right separation was just kind of a rough calculation for somebody standing over a golf ball. It turns out that vernier acuity is really insensitive to lots of things. You can have lousy visual acuity and still have good vernier acuity. So you can take off your glasses and maybe still see these displacements that's there, even though you might not be able to read letters uh, very well. So this, this vernier acuity is kind of a, a really kind of robust kind of measure and kind of a very non-sensitive to lots of other factors, as long as you kind of get things generally set up right. Okay, so that's the idea. So what the question was now, we were gonna try to measure how well a person aims a golf ball with these three lines on. And the, the, the question comes up is, well, maybe you just have somebody putt the ball. And you can see, do they make more putts using three lines versus a standard one line? And it turns out, well, we don't want to do that because there's all these other factors that come into play. We just want to know if they aim better. That's our question. Do you aim better when you have these three lines versus not having three lines? It's there. So first we thought about putting a ball in a protractor and having people line. That's way too crude of a measure to do things. Turns out if you're off by just even tenths of a degree, that translates out over five feet or ten feet away to kind of big errors that may be there. We tried doing it with an angular measurement that you can do with cell phones. and do it. All those things didn't work. And we finally came up with a way, and again, that's kind of what's nice about having a team is we kind of came up with this other way of doing it, of putting a laser inside the ball. And this was not, this is, you don't use a laser for golfing, but this is just to test the three lines. And it turns out that sounds like a trivial task. I can take this laser and, you know, put this laser, oops, I didn't mean to do that. I went way too fast, I hit the wrong button. Uh, if, if I have this laser that I could put inside a golf ball and, you know, be able to, to do that, that, that might be a way to do it. It turns out that commercially available lasers, they're never centered right inside of their tube that's there. They're not made to be really accurately centered. So we had to kind of come up with a way and actually kind of devise a way to make sure that the, the, this laser we have is exactly centered in the ball and centered within the tube that, that is going to be derived. So we basically had to make a laser from scratch uh, to, to, to kind of do this kind of task. So this is kind of what the idea was. We're going to have this laser that's going to fit inside this ball. If the person is behind the ball, they didn't even see the laser that's there. They're going to align the ball to a target, and then we can turn the laser on once they say it's aligned. We don't want to touch the ball, because even if you touch that, that ball just a little bit, if it's sitting on the grass, it's going to move it. So we had to have a way to externally turn it on, and that's what we did. We have an external switch to kind of turn this on. So we have a person align the ball, turn the switch on, and you can see exactly how far they're from the center or not from the center away from this, this hole that we're trying to putt. We took this ball with had three stripes on and had just another kind of standard ball that just had a single little stripe that many people use to align putts with and compared a single line to the three lines. We did it at the golf course at Normandy. We got a bunch of golfers that varied a lot in terms of what their skill levels were. We asked what their handicap level was for, that was kind of just a crude way of kind of saying kind of how, how good of a golfer they were and kind of use that as a way to kind of see what's happening. This, oh, this is the laser part I was talking about. We had to actually kind of build this part and this was, it, it, it's hard to describe from this kind of picture, but this is all very high tolerance machining that this 
collar fits inside the ball that's there so you know once it's centered it's absolutely centered in terms of this 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 alignment process it's there. So we're not putting. It, 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 it absolutely does change the weight of the ball. And it would, if, if we were trying to putt the ball and kind of do anything else, that would be the problem. We're just asking the person just to line this, this ball up. That's all we're asking them to do. But that's, uh, if, if we were doing other things, that certainly would be an issue. If we, if we tried to have them putt or do anything else, that, that would be a problem. Okay? So again, this is kind of this, this is the front view of the ball. We kind of made a little cap to fit over top, so you really had a hard time seeing it. If you were from the back side of the ball, I showed you that picture from the back side. This is a picture from the front side of the ball. And I think it's going to talk when I talk. It may, I may, it may be having me mumble, I'm sorry. But we can just come over and turn that ball on then. So there's off, and now it can turn it on. So that, that was the idea. All right? Again, I, I don't want to go into a lot of the numbers, but it turns out just very small displacements have these big displacements of the balls. You can kind of make these calculations of how big the ball is to the cup and kind of think about sort of, you know, kind of when you're way far off or not f way far off. Uh, what we did is we, we took this to the golf course. We looked at 52 golfers. We looked at our, we calling that the triple track, those three lines versus a single line. We had people line up either five feet away or 10 feet away and line up with a single stripe or line up with a triple track and can turn on the laser and see kind of how accurate they were. We also asked them how confident they were in putting and we all, in, in aligning uh, and also asked them if they had a preference for the single line or the, 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 the triple track. Really interesting, really, really interesting to me as somebody who was not a golfer is you can have a fairly experienced golfer come and put the ball down, even just five feet away, line the putt up, say, I am confident on a scale of five out of five, that's right in the center of the cup. It could be, it could be more than a cup length off to the side. So people, even from the very start, even before that you're, you're putting, people are not aligning the ball to start with. And I'm not the first person to say that there's actually now evidence from people that do a lot of kind of very sensitive kinds of measures of golfers, it's in, at least in elite golfers, one of the things that's been shown is the biggest predictor of whether a person is going to make a putt or not is gonna, whether it's aimed properly or not. Elite putters all have the same stroke. If the stroke's not going to vary, it's going to stay constant. So you've got to be able to read greens and get that Get, get that putt aligned how you want it to, to actually go in. What we did was we found it was actually pretty consistent. It was a little bit better for 10 feet away than it was for 5 feet away, but roughly 11-12% increase in accuracy. Whoa! That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's pretty nice. And it actually just, again, totally, totally, totally anecdotal. But Ray Barrett's, I didn't, I forgot to say that it was, as part of my story was Ray Barrett, when he was golfing, he usually just did nine holes. And he says, I usually get, he wasn't a great golfer. He said, I usually get 50 uh, for nine holes. Uh, and he says, all of a sudden, now I'm getting 45 when I'm using three lines and a ball. And that's about 10%. <laughs> okay, you, you with me? All right. And so the, I was just going to mention this. This is the other thing about the, I'm talking about these large errors. That, that's when I was trying to do that physics part of saying kind of when somebody makes a big error, they're kind of way far off the cup. Well, at five feet away, three out of the 52 people made these large errors. One person, w with a single line, only one person did it with a triple track. Nine out of 52 people at 10 feet away made these very large errors just in aligning. And then three out of 52 did with the triple track. Now, again, I'm not saying this is making you get 
making it act like it's a five feet away instead of 10 feet away, but it's, these numbers are kind of just, uh, just to kind of show you and just kind of get this idea of may, where there, there can be this kind of improvement that's there. Okay? Everybody's with me. So fast forward many years. And it just took, th this, is, this is a whole other story. I don't want to go into this whole other story, but Callaway mm -hmm. licensed the ball. And they licensed this triple track technology is what, the, what it ended up being called. And very first time it was used on the PGA, Phil Mickelson used it. He shot a 60. That's what he, that's what he did this earlier this year. He got a 60 the first time he used the triple track. He got, he got second place in that tournament. The next tournament he used it, he won. Yui Kawamoda is a Japanese LPGA golfer. She won with the triple track ball uh, at a tournament this year. It's now starting to creep in. As I mentioned Kelly Craft. There's, gonna, there's other people that are starting to use the ball is what I'm understanding. So this is really kind of an exciting thing. And it's kind of one of these, again, you don't think about this necessarily of uh, this is not necessarily optometry but this is vision and this is vernier acuity and kind of understanding things and kind of building things and understanding how the system's working uh so this is all kind of part of the process that goes on yes so 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 again so if a person wants to use it they can if they don't want to use it they don't have to use it too that's the idea I just was going to mention it's kind of everywhere now, so it's, it's, it's everywhere in the world. Uh, so I just grabbed these images off the internet and the, you can, languages and other things from all over the world. It's kind of an amazing kind of thing, so it's kind of a neat thing to see. So what does Kale Origami and Phil Mickelson have in common? Well, they all have this vision science connection at UMSL. Uh, they're all kind of at least related to structure and function in the eye and what's going on. And all of these kind of have implications beyond the eye and kind of what, what, what happens. And all of these projects, they all started with sort of this cold call. I made one of those cold calls. Two other people made cold calls to me. Sometimes you just kind of have to take risks and do things. And not, I'm not a golfer, but you know, this Sometimes you need to take risks and kind of do things and think things are seem interesting and they can kind of lead you down paths that you might not expect that they're going to lead you down. So that's kind of what I'm hoping you get from this. Oh, I just want to mention this is Healthy Vision Month too. I'm going to end with that. So make sure you see your eye care professional and there's lots of things we can kind of think about for uh, Healthy Vision Month. Um, and uh, I think that's where I'll stop. Sorry, I, I kind of rambled. <laughs> That is a good question, and, and that's really, you know, that, that's actually a, a really, really good question because it turns out that some people, it seems like no matter how much kale they eat, it's not going to be enough. So that's where supplementation might help uh, because it's, it's a very, it's much larger doses. So sometimes it seems like it may be this process in terms of it's actually not getting shuttled from where it needs to go in, into the eye, so, so I, I can't give you a number because it, it varies from person to person. Oh, okay. So if you take the supplements, how much else do you need? That, again, that's going to vary depending on, and I'm not, I'm not going to make a recommendation for that, uh, for just, it, you'll have to see it. How much time was it between when Ray contacted you <laughs> and so Callaway licensed it? Eight years. Yeah, that's, that's one of the things you don't think about sometimes with some of these journeys too, is they can last a long time. Uh, so that was, it was eight years from the first call. You mentioned the, the three lines um, with, with blanks. I still to this day say that the old faz eye lights for runways mm. It's better than the Pappy, which is much more confusing. Mm. There was something about the three lines yeah. and that black flank 
that was so much more effective. Mm -hmm. You know, now it seems like it's harder to, and that's three and three, you know, right mm -hmm. in there, and mm -hmm. that was your glide slope, but it's mm -hmm. just, and it doesn't matter how bad your vision is, but you're not supposed to let it fog, it works. Yeah. But that's... Are you a pilot? Yes, was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's interesting. Interesting. The new ones, I don't, I don't even know how many likes they have. Now. Yeah, it's yeah, same. yeah. Same principle, mm -hmm. but it just isn't as effective. Anything else? So I, I, I got full scopes. I know you. If anybody wants a full scope, you could have a full scope. Uh, 